No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for. The one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? We're in Colossians, the first chapter, verses 15 through 20. And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you for your text today. Lord, we thank you for the words that you have given me. Lord, transform them into the message that we need to hear. Lord, take these simple words and pour into them with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So today in the church liturgical calendar, and yes, the church has a calendar just like the world has a calendar. The world has a January through December calendar. Well, we have a liturgical calendar that centers around the life of Christ. And so on the church calendar today, it's called Christ the King Sunday or the Reign of Christ Sunday. It's the last Sunday of the Pentecost season, and it's the last Sunday of the Christian year. Uh, just the Sunday just prior to next week is the beginning of a new Christian calendar, and it starts the season of Advent. <clears throat> the observance of Christ the King Sunday is really, relatively new. Uh, it's, it was originally instituted by Pius XI, the Bishop of Rome. Uh, it was to be celebrated on the last Sunday of October. However, after Vatican II, it was moved to its current location the last Sunday of the Christian calendar. Plus, connecting uh, at the time, the, the pious, the, the bishop, was concerned about the increasing denial of Christ as king uh, to the rise of secularism throughout most of Europe. At the time, uh, many Christians, including Catholics, began to doubt Christ's authority and existence as well as the church's power to continue Christ's authority. Pius XI and the rest of the Christian world witnessed the rise of non-Christian or at least nominally Christian dictatorships throughout Europe 
and that had an effect on the Catholics and the early church leaders. The dictators attempted to assert authority also over the church. And so the Feast of Christ the King was instituted during a time when respect for the Christ and for the church was at an all-time low. Sound a bit familiar today? Could Very well. So Christ the King Sunday is this reminder to us to place Christ in a position of respect and the honor that he deserves in our life. Now, Paul wrote this text. Uh, it's believed that he wrote it while he was in his first prison stint in Rome. Paul had never been to Colossae before. That church was an offshoot of the church of Ephesus. And the leaders at Col- Colossae were dealing with, uh, with the faithful teachings of the church being challenged due to a heresy of syncretism of Greek philosophy, Jewish legalism, and mysticism all combined together. So this would be very similar to the Gnostic movement from the, that the early church dealt with and the idea that Jesus was not God, but that he was just a man. Uh, also the idea that Jesus didn't die and resurrect, but that he simply fell asleep on the cross and, and woke up. And so they're pushing this agenda and this idea. The Gnostics held that they were more enlightened than everyone else. They were smarter than everybody else. And so that they understood it better than you understand it. And they considered the rest of the church to be ignorant. Now, the language used today is far different than it was back in Paul's day. Nonetheless, someone saying that we're far more educated and trained than they were back in those days uh, still doesn't prove your point. It just doesn't make you look any smarter than, than you really are. And so it's the very reason that Jesus chose the uneducated, the simple down-to-earth people to be his disciples, people like me. You know, some years ago, it came across my idea in this little brain of mine that maybe I should go get my doctorate. got my master's, maybe I should have a doctorate. And I I really, we were living in Jinx at the time, ORU is right here, why not? And as I prayed about it, God said, why? Why? And I said, thank God. (laughs) What do you need it for, Rudy? To make men happy or to make me happy? And I decided I didn't need it. And I praise God I didn't need it. People get hung up so much on their own ego, sometimes that they ruin their own faith. And so the whole ideology and thought here is that when we're simple people, We're humble people, and we never put ourselves ahead of where God might be leading us. Now, the false teachers in Colossae, they were dethroning Jesus, and Paul writes this letter to address this heresy. Our text today is placing Christ the King into his rightful place, and it's reminding the church that Jesus is who God says Jesus is. You hear that? Jesus is who God, God's word, says Jesus is. Now, just prior to this text, we see that Paul is telling the church that they're being prayed for. Verse 9, for this reason also since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The greatest thing that we can do for our church and Christendom in general, folks, is to pray. Prayer is the foundation. Prayer that God would fill it with wisdom and knowledge and the Spirit, and that we would have spiritual understanding of who God is and and where God wants us to go. That's why I love the fact that prayer is a pillar here at St. James Church. Prayer is a foundation. It's built into the fabric of this church. From the very founding of this church, prayer is essential. Every morning during the week at 7.30 by that fireplace right over there, a group of people gather. And it's different people every day. People, different people come, different people are here. But a group of people gather around that fire and they pray for this church. They pray for the prayer requests that you fill out on Sunday morning or that you send in through the week via email or whatever it is. You are being prayed for, St. James Church. This church is being prayed for, that God's will would be done in this church, that the kingdom would come right here through us and through our actions and our abilities that God has given us. And then on Saturdays at 5.30, a group gather right down here at the front of this sanctuary, and they've prayed over this service Specifically, this service was prayed for yesterday. And I know every Saturday at 5.30, there's a group of faithful people here praying over this church that God would show up today, that God would move me out of the way and that he would show up and transform us into who he wants us to be. And that is a powerful, 
powerful thing. Prayer changes things. Paul in our text reminds the church and us today who Christ is. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. When we say that he is the invisible God, image of the invisible God, it means the manifestation of God to man. John, the first chapter, verses 14 and through 18 says, the word became flesh, Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Now, we still don't know what God looks like, right? Now, some people say they have dreams and they've seen this or they've seen that. But, but no one knows exactly what God looks like. You know, the Old Testament, it was the booming voice, and we were afraid to see God because we might be, be killed if we looked upon the face of God because of our sinfulness and who we were. <clears throat> but no one knows what God looks like. Yet Christ was made known to us through his entrance into humanity. And when Paul says the image, he's telling us that Christ is the express image of God's person. We can get a glimpse at what God looks like through Jesus. Now, not the physical characteristics. We know that they have glorified bodies. They are, they're God. If we remember in John, the 14th chapter, verse 9, Jesus stated, He that has seen me has seen the Father. And when we talk about the firstborn of all creation, it does not mean Jesus was born first. Rather, it means that Jesus was prior to all of creation. He was not created. He was eternal God and will always be eternal God. Verse 16 of our text, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth. I just have to say, whenever, whenever uh, Pastor Willie and I uh, coordinate song and scripture, uh, it's not like what you think. <laughs> Remember the words of the text today of the song? Through him all things and in him all, right? But we didn't coordinate that. God coordinated that. I just think that's a beautiful thing. Both the... It says, verse 16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. Friends, Jesus created all things, everything, everything you see, everything you have. Now, we being in the image of Christ are creative beings, aren't we? We create our own things sometimes. People build things and and create things and things that, but if we truly believe that God created all things, He created us, He created our mind, He gave us the ability to create things, then all things are created by God. But not just by Him, for Him. Every single thing ever created was created for Him. Now we see an awful lot of people and things in our world that are not operating in a way that reflects who Christ is. And I can't even imagine the heartache it must be for God to bring into existence us, a creation, when we on our own free will do things contrary to God's character. You see, Jesus created humanity for his own self, not for us. You were not created to go and live your life how you want, chase your own dreams and desires. No, you were created by God for God's purpose. And when you reject who God created you to be, you're rejecting God. We live in a crazy society right now. I can tell you today, I'm a man or I'm a cat, and you have to accept that. Those people are rejecting who God created them to be. God created me to be a man. I'm living into that. And if you think about those people, they are depressed. They're not happy in life. When we reject who God created us to be, we are depressed because we're not living into who God created us to be. When we understand that Christ is Lord of all and that our obedience to who he created us to be is the key to unspeakable joy, 
That's when things change. But you have to understand who you are in Christ first. Once you grasp that, your life will never be the same. Now, the Greek philosophers taught that in all things, all things had a primary cause, an instrumental cause, and a final cause. The primary cause is the plan. The instrumental cause is the power. And the final cause is the purpose of it. And in creation, we see that Jesus is all three. As primary cause, he planned it. An instrumental cause, he produced it. And as final cause, he did it for his own pleasure. He encompasses all three. And when we live into who and what God made us to be, we're living in harmony with Christ. And when you live in harmony with Christ, things are good. The enemy can attack you. Things are still good. The world can throw things at you. Things are still good. The greatest lie ever perpetuated on the church is if you'll accept Jesus, everything's going to be just fine. It's a lie. If you accept Jesus, the enemy's coming at you with everything he has. But Jesus will stand with you. Jesus will defend you in the midst of that storm. When Jesus is standing with you, and you've placed him in authority, your life is in harmony with Christ. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. Warren Wearsby tells the story of a group of people going on a tour of, of an atomic laboratory. And the, guy, the guide explained to them how all the matter was composed of rapidly moving electric particles. And the tourists studied the models and the molecules. They were amazed to learn that the matter is made up of primarily space. So at the end of the tour, the guide asked for if there were any questions. And one person said, if this is the way matter works, what holds it all together? To which the guide had no answer. You see, as Christians, we know the answer. Christ holds all things together. Because he was before all things and is the creator of all things. Because he was before creation, because he is God, and because he makes creation cohere together. Just the idea that if the earth was a fragment of a centimeter off of axis, how this would, life would not be possible should tell you all you need to know about a creator God who holds everything in tension. Verse 18 of our text. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. <clears throat> the New Testament lays out many beautiful pictures of what the church is, and the most, I think, important image of the church is as a body. We are a body Romans 12, 4 through 6, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Some of you are a thumb. That's okay. We need a thumb, right? To pick things up. Some of you are an appendix. You might think you're worthless, but trust me, there's a reason. We're all a part of the body. We all have an individual function. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into the body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. We all come together. We work for the glory of the kingdom. We're all apart. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We're all a part of the body of Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a part of the body of Christ. Plain and simple. And we all have a function. Whenever you start to reach for a flame, your brain says, that's hot, don't touch it, right? 
and you don't touch it. When one of us does something we're not supposed to and everybody else says, hey, we shouldn't do it that way, we save the person from going in the wrong direction. Jesus is the head of the church. In the Greek, the word head means source, leader, one of superior rank. Paul tells us that that Jesus is the head from the beginning. And then Paul calls Jesus the firstborn from the dead. Now, he's not saying that Jesus was the first to be raised from the dead because we know that's not true. We know Lazarus was raised from the dead, right? What he's saying is is that, that Jesus was the first to be resurrected from the dead. You see, without Jesus' resurrection, there would be no resurrection for us. Because of Christ, those who believe in him will be resurrected to glory when they pass from this life or when Christ returns to call us home to gather the church. We will be resurrected. There is a hope of our faith that when this thing is over, when my ache and back is done and this and that's over, I'm going to the king. Now, if you take away the resurrection, there is no hope. If you diminish the resurrection by saying Christ was not God and did not resurrect, then there is really not a reason to be a Christian, is there? This would be a sham. I mean, I guess politically you could say, I go to church, I'm a Christian. (laughs) So you get advancement in the world because people look favorably upon that, at least in this country. Friends, that's a dead end road. That leads nowhere. Believing Jesus is God and he rose from the dead is a core doctrinal belief. And if you can't confess that, then you're not a member of the body of Christ. Jesus' resurrection changes everything for us. Verse 18 ends with the entire reason of this letter. So that he, Jesus himself, might come to have first place in everything. Hear that again. So that Jesus himself might come to have first place in everything. Say first place. First place. In everything. Not some things. Not a little of this or a little of that. In everything Christ has first place. The King James Version uses the word preeminence. And that word is actually found nowhere else in the Bible. The Greek word means to be first have first place. This is who Christ is. He is first in all things in a believer's life. To say Jesus Christ is Lord and make him first over all of the things is an acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is God and he holds leadership over your entire life. When I wrote my doctrinal uh, statements for my ordination, my first ordination, I uh, had to defend what it means for Christ to be Lord. And as every good uh, ordination person going through the process does, they send it off to a proofreader so that you don't look stupid on the first pass, right? And so I sent it off to a clergy colleague, and he called me up, and he said, Rudy, your lordship of Jesus, man. I was like, oh, this is not going to be good. I'm going to have to rewrite it, or I'm going to have to change something. And I have, he says, maybe the best I've ever read. I was like, really? Ego. I got that down under control. Um, but I was like, really? And, and really, the only thing I said was is that Jesus is number one. Nothing else matters outside of Christ. Hear that? If you go to Piper and you ask her what the single most important thing in her life is, she's not going to say Rudy Freeze. She's not even going to say her girls, which are pretty high up there. She's not even going to say Milo or Ollie, our dogs. <laughs> Jesus Christ. He's above her in my life. When you place anything above Christ, you have removed Christ's authority in your life. You have taken his throne away. For me, it's a Galatians 2.20 moment. It's where we say for ourselves that I no longer live. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And that's how I want to live my life. Now, Do we struggle? Yes. We all have, I call them Rudy moments, where Rudy steps up and takes that throne away for a minute until I realize what I've done and I humble myself and allow Christ back into that position. We all do that. That's human nature. But we have to set aside our old ways. We've crucified 
the old self. It's dead. It's gone. Now we walk in who Christ is calling us to be. We want to emulate Christ's ministry to the world around us. And giving Christ full reign is not easy. It's not for the faint of heart. Because I can tell you, God will destroy an ego if you have one. (laughs) Ask me how I know. (laughs) He will break down your thoughts on how you think things should be. Ask me how I know. (laughs) And he will place you in uncomfortable positions. For his purposes, not yours. And it's all to accomplish his kingdom goals here on this earth. He uses us for that. Jesus Christ of Lord of Lords holds much deeper connotations than just lordship over the Christian life. If we understand that Christ created all things and all things for himself, we have to understand all things. The world around us, the, the, the natural creation, we should have a concern for all things that it's being used for God's reasons. That's why he created it. Now, verse 19 and 20 of our text moves us from talking about Christ's relationship to lost sinners and to the next two verses focus on the father and the son relationship. Verse 19, for it was the father's good pleasure. I don't know if I make the father happy, but it would sure be nice to hear one day that God found pleasure in who I am and what I've done. For it was in God, the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, to dwell in Jesus. All of God's fullness to dwell in Jesus. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Again, Paul's telling the Gnostics at the church of Coloss- Colossae that the, and the churches today that are spreading false teaching, Jesus is God. End of story. When he states God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, the word translated for fullness is pleroma. And it was a technical term that the Gnostics were throwing around. They were, they were using it willy-nilly. And so Paul's speaking their language to confront their false teaching. The word meant the sum total of all the divine power and attributes. So Paul uses it eight times in his entire letter. And don't you just hate it when someone uses your own words against you. And that's what he does. Now the word dwell is important too because it means more than just to reside somewhere. It means to be at home permanently. Christ is at home permanently in God because they are one. They aren't different. They are the same. And that's the promise of the Holy Spirit. When we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit is given to us, the Holy Spirit indwells dwells inside of us, meaning that the Holy Spirit's at home permanently with us. And you can run from that Holy Spirit all you want, but it's there, and it's always going to be there. And it's going to raise his little head when you don't want it to raise his little head. But once you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is permanently dwelling just as Jesus is permanently dwelling with God. Since Jesus is God, he can do what no human can do. He can reconcile the lost sinner to a holy God. And that is good news for you and I. Do we have any non-sinners in the room today? Anyone? (laughs) Just checking the pulse. Sometimes you don't know your crowd very well. We all are. We fall. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's reconciling us to God. He's making it possible for us to stand before the throne. Where before, if we stood before the throne, we'd hear, guilty, away from me, wicked sinner. Instead, because Jesus sacrificed on the cross, we stand in front of the throne and we hear, okay, come on in. Love you. You see, that's the key to our eternal salvation. A Christ who reconciles us to a holy God. The question today is, are you tired of living a life of less than? Not quite full. Are you exhausted from trying to figure out what your niche in life is? 
Are you feeling the effects of trying to live life as Lord of your own existence? You see, that's a painful experience. And I know that because I tried it. I sought the acceptance of the world. I climbed the corporate ladder. I did all that fun stuff. (laughs) And it wasn't fun. I had to have the next biggest, better thing. I had a friend. It was a competition. Back whenever TVs came out in HDMI. Hey, Rudy, I got the new HDMI. Uh, Not even on the market yet, but I have it. What did I want? HDMI. That's the world talking to us. We chase the American dream. We, We want the things that the world wants, and we think it'll fill us, but it won't. The words of Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. And it stunk. It took me far too long to figure it out, friends. You can try it on your own, but I promise you this, you will never find the joy of the Lord until you're willing to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus' reign. You have to give it all up to get it all. Makes no sense, does it? You've got to give it all up to get it all. Everything your heart desires is waiting if you'll give up everything you think your heart desires and seek Jesus. I'm going to ask Willie to make his way forward. I want to provide the opportunity today for you to make Jesus Lord of your life. Some of us fake it. I faked it for years. I pretended. Everybody around me would have said, good Christian, or he's a good Christian. But I needed the Lord to reign more than I needed Rudy to reign in my life. And so if you've never taken the opportunity to make Jesus Lord of your life, I want to make that available today. Maybe you're sitting here today and you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. You've been coming to church because that's what your family did for generations. And so you've decided to continue that because it just is the thing you do. But you've never said yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior. I want to provide the opportunity for you to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you're miserable. You're suffering. Pain. Sickness disease, sin. Christ wants to take that from you today. So I'm going to take just a minute today and we're going to offer an opportunity for you to come forward for prayer for any of those or anything else you need prayer for. Piper and I will be down front. The Bible says, if you're sick, bring them before the elders. Anoint them with oil. Pray over them. The prayers of the righteous will bring healing. We have oil. We'd love to pray over you. Let me pray. As they sing, you're invited to come. Gracious God, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for what it means to have him as our Lord and Savior. Lord, forgive us when we fail. We place other things above you. Lord, help us to place you in a right place today. Lord, stir our hearts. If we need to come forward, Lord, stir us even more and send us forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Please come as you feel led. Amazing grace.
butterflies in your stomach right now. That's not what you ate for breakfast. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. If you need to come forward, we're not gonna we're not gonna Baptist this and do all 18 verses. But I want you to have your opportunity. Come forward if you need prayer today. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come and to surrender our lives. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you need prayers this week and you didn't come forward, raise a hand so I know who to pray for. I see that hand and that hand. That hand and that hand. And that hand. And that hand. God, thank you so much for a love that loves us beyond compare, a love that says, even though you're a sinner, you're still mine, a love that chases and pursues us, a love that breaks the chains and sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen.